All modern technology that humans enjoy rely upon electrical circuits. Things like computers, cars, smartphones, and even the wiring in your house is all different versions of the same pieces. Those pieces are called circuit components. And what you're going to see eventually in this class is things like circuit diagrams, which are basically just images with shapes on them that are supposed to tell you something that you're supposed to put together on your desk. And looking at an image like this might be a little bit overwhelming. But don't worry, we're going to learn what each and every one of these pieces are, and we're eventually we're going to become masters at putting them together and knowing what they represent. So let's take a look at the first circuit component, which is a simple wire, also sometimes called a lead. A uh, wire is just something that allows electrons to move. We have a definition right here. It creates a path for electrons to travel. Now, the way that we're going to be drawing this in circuit diagrams is really simple. It's just going to be a straight line. That's how you'll sketch a wire. Usually, we'll be using rulers to make sure our lines are perfectly straight, just because that makes a nice, pleasing image. But really, there's not that much complexity to this. It is, after all, a line. So we're going to move right along. The next thing that we're going to be putting into our circuits is called a cell. You may recognize the image that you're seeing right now as a battery, but actually that's a misnomer. A battery is actually several cells, as we'll see in a little bit. The word cell implies that you have a source of voltage. We've hopefully discussed by this point in class what voltage is, if you're watching this video. So voltage being a potential difference between two points, or an electrical pressure difference with more electrons on one side, less electrons on the other, that's voltage. And a cell basically provides that voltage. A cell is nothing more than a cathode and an anode, which is two different types of metal, one which really likes to gather electrons, and one which likes to shoo them away. And if you put electrolytes in the middle, which is a mixture of chemicals, uh, then the electrons will flow in one direction, and that's what a cell is. If you've ever been curious, specifically this brand called Duracell, why do you think they named themselves Duracell? They're trying to say that they make a durable cell. That's the idea. How are we going to draw a cell in our circuit diagrams? So well, it's going to look like this. It's a line that is interrupted by a space, and the space has two lines, one of which is longer, one of which is shorter. The longer line represents the positive terminal, and the shorter line represents the negative terminal. That's it. And just as a side note, the electrons come out of the negative side of the terminal, in case you were curious, and I'm sure you were. Now, I mentioned this already, but when you have multiple cells all lined up, what you've got is a battery. The word battery in the English language actually generally refers to many things, or a set of things. Uh, and in this case, in the image that you're seeing right here, this is a calculator, and if you open the back of your calculator, assuming it's a similar brand to the TI-83, which I had in high school, then uh, what you're seeing is four batteries that are all kind of mismatched, and you might be curious why the batteries all face different ways. Well, that's just kind of the way they design it, so that this can happen. So that the charges can flow through one battery, and then into the next, and then into the next, and then into the next, and eventually after four batteries are all lined up, then we can power the device with those four cells. Now, if each cell has 1.5 volts, as a AA battery does, then you're doing 1.5 plus 1.5 plus 1.5 plus 1.5 means 6 volts are what's actually powering your battery. So that's just one example. Car batteries are very similar. It's not a misnomer to call a car battery a battery, even though it looks like one object instead of several, because in reality, if you were to open up a battery, you'd see that inside there are actually several cells. In this case, the diagram we're seeing shows us six 2-volt cells, which nominally will create a 12-volt battery, and that's what will power your car. Now, how are we going to draw this in our circuit diagrams? Well, a battery is basically just an amalgamation of many cells. So in this case, we're taking the example from the calculator image, where there are four cells lined up. In this case, in the diagram, we're seeing, again, four cells lined up. And still, just like last time, the side that has the long end is still representing the positive end, and the side that is the short end is still representing the negative. So those two terminals are always going to be based on which side is longer and which side is shorter. Positive is longer, negative shorter. Uh. <laughs> Moving right along. A switch is something that can either turn on a circuit or turn off a circuit. You'll be familiar with switches because anytime you enter a room, generally you turn the lights on or off, and when you do that, you are using a switch. Now, you might not be able to see what's inside of a switch when you're turning a light on and off because it's hidden behind the wall, but if you want to look at what's really going on, you can look at these other two images I've got right here. The open switch is two pieces of metal that are specifically not being connected by a piece in the middle, which sometimes acts as a lever in the case that you're seeing right here. So the lever or the switch is open in this case, and that means metal contact is not being made, which means the electrons can't continually move through the loop of a circuit. So an open switch means you have broken the circuit. It cannot have electrons flow through it. The closed switch, on the other hand, that one, the lever has come down and is making contact with both of the metal pieces, so that means electrons can flow from 
one piece to the other because they have a metal bridge to travel on. So an open switch breaks a circuit and a closed switch turns on a circuit. And that was actually an aptly timed uh, light shutting off because the motion detector in my classroom hasn't seen me move around for a little while because I've been getting ready to make this screencast. And as a result, the motion detector has opened a switch where it's programmed to uh, detach part of the circuit if no motion is detected for a certain period of time. So what I'm now going to do is get out of my chair and walk around a little bit and that switch will reclose because of the sensors that are in the motion detector. So watch me do that. And there you go, science. So how are we going to draw switches in our circuit diagrams? They're going to look like this. An open switch is going to be drawn with two hinges and a barn door being open is how I always like to picture this. It's kind of like looking at a blueprint for a house and you're looking down on a doorway. When the doorway is open, that'll be our drawing for an open switch. And when the doorway is closed, that'll be our closed switch. So they're basically exactly the same thing, just drawn in two different states. They really are one object, just two different ways it can exist. Next on our list are resistors. Resistors are designed specifically to slow down electrons, thereby reducing the current that's in a circuit. So why would we do this? Well, if electrons are allowed to move as fast as they want, that means the current in our circuit will be extremely high, which can be dangerous because as we've learned, high currents can cause damage to the human cells and to electrical equipment. So resistors allow us to tone down the electricity to the exact amount that we want. You wouldn't want your iPhone exploding and catching fire just from you plugging it into the wall. So the resistors inside of the phone allow it to get the proper amount of electricity. Resistors can look like any number of things, but generally they look like very, very small cylinders, about the size of a paper clip, maybe smaller, uh, in some cases much smaller. Uh, and all they are designed to do is just be put right in the middle of a circuit to decrease the amount of flow, to slow the electrons. That's the idea. And you can see these in motherboards of computers and all kinds of equipment. We're going to draw them like this in our circuit diagrams. And it's kind of interesting. They don't really look all that much like their real life counterpart, but the imagery is supposed to bring to mind that when an electron moves through a circuit and reaches a resistor, it's going to bounce around and knock into other electrons a lot, or it's going to smack into the walls of the resistor, because that's actually what happens. Electrons will knock into each other or the walls of the resistor, and that's what slows them down. So the imagery in this sketch is supposed to show that knocking around. So that's why it's a jagged line like that. That brings us to our next category, which is lamps and bulbs. These are things that turn electrical energy, the motion of electrons, into electromagnetic energy, or light, as we've studied in this class before. The incandescent bulbs, circa Thomas Edison, and fluorescent bulbs, and LED bulbs, and all kinds of bulbs, all actually operate in different ways, um, but they all produce light, and so that makes them kind of similar to each other. They all actually have their own symbols as well, but we're going to simplify things and just use in this class at least these two symbols, which will represent incandescent bulbs for us. Either one of them are good. They mean pretty much the same thing. You'll see the top one more than the bottom one, but they mean about the same thing. It means an incandescent bulb that turns electricity into light energy, or at least mostly into light energy. This is usually a little bit of heat as well, depending on the kind of bulb you have. So those are lamps and bulbs. Now that actually covers all of the devices that we'll be using, but there are some measurement tools that I haven't talked about yet that are going to be important for us to analyze as well. One is called a voltmeter, one is called an ammeter, and they operate very, very similarly, but they measure different things. And so that's going to get confusing. So let's learn as much as we can about voltmeters and ammeters, and then we'll be pretty much done. A voltmeter measures the amount of voltage between two points in a circuit. We've discussed, again, what voltage is. It is a difference in electrical pressure between one point and another. So a voltmeter takes two wires and looks at two different points and says, how much difference is there? And it says, that's the voltage. The difference between two points is a voltage that a voltmeter detects. An ammeter is different. It sits right in the middle of a circuit and measures the amount of flow or current that's moving through a circuit. So an ammeter detects flow, voltmeter looks at two spots and tells you what the difference is. This is gonna to be tough to not mix them up because they look very similar to each other, at least in appearance, especially the ones we have in class, but you'll get used to it. This is how we'll draw them in our circuit diagrams. A voltmeter is a circle with a V and an ammeter is a circle with an A, pretty straightforward. Now these will be our measurement tools, and the reason I put them in color here, just to make them seem different, because they really are not circuit components. They don't do anything to the circuit, at least ideally, um, if they're used properly. And speaking of using them properly, maybe we should talk about how to use these things. So here's just a very simple circuit diagram. What we have here, you should be able to tell me, but I'll tell you in this case. On top we have a cell, not a battery, and on the right hand side we have a lamp, and on the bottom we have an ammeter, and attached to the bulb we have a 
voltmeter. So we've got four components here, but really only two that affect the circuit's behavior. The other two, the ammeter and the voltmeter, were actually just there to observe, to measure. So they don't actually do anything, but they can tell us useful information. So let's see what uh, we have to learn here. The first thing that we have to pay attention to is that the ammeter allows electrons to pass through it. That's what it has to do in order to measure the flow. It can't see the flow of electrons if the flow doesn't move through it. So, for that reason, electrons can pass through an ammeter. That means that you have to connect your ammeter in series with your circuit. That means it has to be inside the main loop in order to properly see how electrons are moving. Now, that's different from a voltmeter because, as you're seeing, there's kind of a dotted line on the voltmeter, and that's supposed to tell you that it's not in the main loop of the circuit. Instead, voltmeters are connected in parallel. That's because electrons cannot pass through a voltmeter at all. There's kind of like a wall in the middle of a voltmeter where electrons can see the electrons on the other side, and they can tell how much difference there is between two points, but they can't actually get to each other. There's no passing through a voltmeter for an electron. So that means if you were to connect a voltmeter right in the main loop of the circuit, nothing would be able to flow because electrons can't get through a voltmeter. They're stuck on one side of the wall. Instead, voltmeters have to connect in parallel, which means outside of the main loop. Generally, you'll take two wires connected to your voltmeter, and you'll put those two wires on either side of an object, like a lamp or a resistor, and what you'll get is a reading for the voltage across that device. So in this case, we might get a measurement of 6 volts, and what we'd say is the voltage across that light bulb is 6 volts. That's how we would say it. So, those are all the components you're going to need to know about in order to be able to build circuits like the one you saw at the very beginning of this lesson. Although it may have seemed a little bit intimidating at the time, hopefully it now looks a bit more approachable. If you need to review what any of these components are, feel free to just rewind the video. Otherwise, good luck, and I'll see you in the next one.